by the way, fair trade is an area that might have a lot of impact for the Congo. Um, you know, the Fair Trade Labeling Organization, FLO, as you may know, has been working with, with artisanal miners, the, the small miners that are using uh, you know, shovels and picks to extract minerals. But we've also heard today, and this is very true, that those efforts need to be linked up with a whole bevy of other efforts. And this is something else that, that you guys have, I think, is, is um, potential leaders and actual leaders. And that is the idea of looking at things in a multi-dimensional perspective. Um, by the end of my time as a private practitioner in law, I think my greatest value added was not drafting contracts and negotiating deals or litigating cases. It was really, you know, the experience that comes by seeing the patterns of foreign law and the way law interacts with technology, with economic development, with cultural opportunities to help companies both enter foreign markets but also do so ethically. And that's the sort of thing that can really add value now. It can't be outsourced very easily because it's about judgment. So that's something else that you can keep in mind, is the need to link up these efforts. And when you're brainstorming tomorrow, I hope you'll actively consider some of the things we've heard about, but to make explicit, the link between security and development and infrastructure and investment opportunities, creative uses of information technology. We'll come back to that, but I just wanted to set the seed for right now. I then went to Nokia, and this was the time when Nokia was changing from literally a, a rubber boot toilet paper company to the greatest mobile phone company. It became the market leader over the period I was there. Um, we never thought that we would you know, take over Motorola and Ericsson, but the company did. And part of the reason was, I think, the values of the company. It's a Finnish company, so it was in Scandinavia. Mobile phone communications, you may not know this, but actually originated because the, the need for people to communicate across great distances in the Arctic Circle to help each other out in times of, of you know, cold weather and so forth. So it was really almost a survival mechanism. Um, at Nokia, uh, I wrote the code of conduct for the company in the mid-90s, which was uh, a, a great privilege to do so. It was, again, another way that you can look for synergies between following your bliss, which in my case was human rights, and doing what was necessary for business. And as I say, the values that were articulated, which included a commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a commitment to um, have ethical action, not just by uh, you know, having employees told what to do ethically, but to have them float up issues. There wasn't just uh, an environment of being permitted to ask questions, but you were actually, it said in the Code of Conduct, obligated to raise issues with your manager and, if necessary, with the top executives of the company. This is a company of tens of thousands of people already in the mid-90s if you had any questions about the ethical action of the company. Because in our code of conduct, you know, we expressly said we are committed to the highest standards of legal ethics and also you know, the universal human rights, the global environmental standards, and so forth. Now, Nokia last uh, summer didn't keep up with those commitments. Um, it and a joint venture that it did with Siemens was involved in providing surveillance equipment to Iran, which was used actually for repression, torture, uh, imprisonment, even the, the murder of some protesters by the Iranian regime. And so it actually was then hauled before the European Parliament and had to make an apology. I think they have a new sense of the need to get back to the values that were such a competitive advantage when I was there. They allowed us to have great stakeholder relations, practically no litigation, and attract the best employees. We had wonderful engineers from around the world because the values were so important. They were a sort of magnetic soft power for the company, akin to the soft power that the United States, at its best, has had. Now we've heard that the United States history in this region, in the Congo, has been less than ideal with the CIA's involvement in the assassination of Patrice Lubamba and so forth. <clears throat> so then at Nokia, I was really happy to see you know, something that I never expected um, really take momentum. That was the whole business and human rights movement. You know, the, uh, the code of conduct and the procedures that Nokia drafted in the 90s and the procedures at Starbucks and Anita Roddick at the Body Shop really started gathering momentum. And from these little snowflakes, we had an avalanche to where nowadays, beyond my wildest dreams, we have, you know, you guys are working on conflict minerals. This is on the agenda of every NGO, human rights NGO, development NGOs in the world. are all looking at the intersection between business and human rights and CSR, which does not stand for Corporate Scandal Response. It stands for Corporate Social Responsibility. Um, so I, I then 
Left Nokia, helped to start some businesses here in Silicon Valley in Texas. Returned to teaching. I had been teaching on the side and then full time for a, a little while when I was younger. Keeping a little bit of uh, activity in the business world. Those are my main activities today. Um, but, you know, as, a, as a, a legal academic now who keeps active in the human rights field, I've been to the Congo a number of times. Um, as a tourist, as a human rights researcher, and as, as a business lawyer. So I've seen it from different dimensions. And if you've visited the reason and seen the, you know, the ongoing horrors there, it's really the opposite of, you know, having been to the mountaintop. You really see the depths from which humanity has to climb. And we've heard about some of these. We've heard about the history that David told you about. And it, he had the King Leopold's ghost slide up that, you know, Adam Hotzschild wrote about. Even before that time, though, of course, we shouldn't forget, Congo was a key nexus in the slave trade as well. You know, there was slavery, a, a paradigm of business and human rights issue. And there were even human rights courts in the 19th century that people didn't know about until recently when my colleague at the law school, Jenny Martinez, wrote a wonderful um, exhumation of this history. But the UK and uh, Latin American countries, the US, had these international courts that, that heard slave cases and uh, Heard over, um, I think, 80,000 80, slaves were freed in 600 cases. So that was a significant thing. You also heard about the birth of the modern human rights movement in connection with the King Leopold ghost situation, the genocide in the Congo at that time that killed 10 or 11 million people. Um, the other rights violations I don't need to reprise for you because you've heard how horrible they are. You've got particularly brutal versions of rape. You've got forced labor, which is tantamount to slavery. It's the contemporary form of slavery. You know, you've got uh, um, women and children that are not only subject to rape and slavery, but also sex trafficking um, and hunger and disease. We haven't talked much about this. There was a little allusion to this, but you know, the Congo is one of the poorest countries in the world, and you know, we've heard that. The world is on track to meet the millennial development goals, you know, the, the metrics that have been agreed upon by the international community, cut poverty in half by 2015 and so forth. Well, the Congo has sort of escaped that. Um, the Congo, I don't know if you've heard, was the worst increase in the recent global hunger index. It was up 65%, and that's because of the increase in food prices. When you've got you know, a billion people in the world that are so hungry they don't know where their next meal is coming from, and you have a country that, you know, unlike China and India, which have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but the Congo is stuck, and it's actually had a worsening situation after the, the global uh, the food crisis. And so that's something we all have to be, be aware of. When that happens, your child mortality rate increases. You know, so it's not one in seven, it's one in six children that die before the age of five. Um, kind of makes our obsessions about the, you know, the royal wedding at Charlie Sheen or everything seem a, a little petty and irrelevant. And it reminds me of how much we all take for granted, right? I mean, I suspect there are a few people in this room that I know very well know exactly what life in the Congo is like. But I suspect that most of us, you know, have not been there. And even if you've been there and popped in and out, as I've done a few times, you don't really experience it viscerally, right? You don't really know what it's like to be hungry. And so, you know, this weekend, one thing you may want to consider, 60,000 students in Canada are going hungry for 30 hours just to see what it's like. You might want to consider that. If you've ever tried it, and I, I've tried it, it's hard to go, I, I can't go three or four hours without eating. <laughs> but, you know, it's really worth putting yourself in that position. And I have tried to do it, you know, even a day is difficult. But to do it for, for 30 hours is, is very difficult. They're raising money uh, to fight poverty in the Congo and elsewhere. Um, we've also heard about how the DRC was affected directly by the Rwandan genocide. You know, that was the, the, the sort of, you know, burst of the, the latest levels of, of, of horrible violence. And then the, the Contra genocide. You know, the UN report last year said that the retaliation itself may have been a genocide. And so you've got really the worst violations in the world happening there. The conflict minerals are part of that, an important part. 